Greetings from Tokyo. Uh, this is Daisuke, and now I would like to talk to you about、uh, the Criterion Collection curated order. Continuing with my discussion of that order, I'd like now to discuss the films in Centerpiece One. Now, I won't be talking about the films in great detail. Because I don't want to spoil them, and I want to leave them、uh, fresh for you to discover if you haven't seen the films yet.、Um, but so, if you haven't,、uh, well, first of all, before I go any further, let me say that I will now be talking about the curated order of the films in Centerpiece One. So, if you do not want to be spoiled by The order of the films in the Criterion Collection curated order for Centerpiece One. Please turn off this video, and after you have finished, please come back, and we can have a discussion. You're still here, so first let me tell you what the titles of the works are in Centerpiece One in the Criterion curated order. So the first film is、uh, the well the television version of Scenes from a Marriage. Next is the U.S. theatrical version of Scenes from a Marriage. Then there is Sarah Band. Then there is From the Life of the Marionettes. Then there is Hour of the Wolf. Then Shame. Then the Passion of Anna. Then For a Document. Then for a document, nineteen seventy nine. Through a glass darkly. Winter light. The silence, and the virgin spring. Now I will be talking in very general terms about these films, in the、uh, curated order, and just talking about the significance of this particular order, at least how I see it. So even if uh, you, uh, well, even though what I'm going to be talking about is very general, and I'm not going to be giving any specific plot points, still, if you are wary about being spoiled, even in the most general terms、uh, regarding any of these films that maybe you haven't seen, then I would strongly suggest that you turn this video off now. And come back to it when you have seen the films, or when you feel comfortable enough to hear a discussion about the general themes、uh, that are being explored in these films. Okay, you're still here, so great. Which means that you don't mind hearing a very generally worded discussion of the themes of these films. Okay, centerpiece one begins with the television version of scenes from a marriage. Now, if you recall, the opening night、uh, ended with a film called Lesson in Love, and a Lesson in Love is a film that is essentially a focus on the relationship between husband and wife. This is a nice segue because in centerpiece one we begin with. The film that is sort of the ultimate in Bergman's filmography that is about the relationship between a husband and wife, and that is scenes from a marriage. And this is、uh, well, unlike well, it is similar to Lesson in Love because of that exploration of this relationship. Right, it's a similar kind of relationship. So in that sense, it's a nice、uh, connection. A very clever way to connect、uh, by Criterion, by the way.、Uh, However, scenes from a marriage is quite a different beast because I would say that it is so、um, emotionally—how、uh, should I put it? Emotionally violent in many places. It is quite intense in many places.、And、it's all—I would say it's almost like war and peace,、uh, and the battlefield is the. Uh, uh, sort of the, a marriage or the human condition in the context of a marriage. So,、uh, and what that means is, of course, you have、uh, scenes of、uh, potent in- intimacy between these two characters, but you also have scenes that show a certain, uh, uh, how should I put it, a, a certain degree of negativity and venom, even. And you don't see it、uh, not just in the context of this this couple, but you also see it in the, in in other、uh, 
couples that are presented in this film. So you do get this sense of uh, kind of the good times and the not so good times, uh, uh, days in the lives of these uh, of this married couple. So scenes of a marriage is a, a I would say a very dark term. It's a very coldly realistic term, or maybe not realistic, but we're dealing with uh, a couple and in many instances uh, in trying to deal with their honest feelings, uh, some cold hard truths come out and uh, depending on your point of view that can be seen maybe as some kind of personal revelation or epiphany on the one hand, or it could be seen as a sort of uh, the gloves are off, no holds barred, uh, real battle here. And so uh, depending on the way you see it, uh, it can be quite a, a tough film and a brutal film uh, in terms of the emotional scarring that is taking place here. And it is at once, I think, quite quite brave and quite joyous at some points even, but also very, uh, it, it takes certain turns that are very uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, emotional, uh, uh, the the emotional toil and the emotional cost, takes turns that I think can be almost very nasty, and uh, that exploration, of course, is so essential to Bergman because humanity is not just all wine and roses, of course, but there is also this idea of what happens when we are in relationships that. Uh, uh, well, we have to question uh, this idea of what is love and uh, does love exist and do we think it exists or uh, if, if we think it exists, does it really exist or if it doesn't exist, then can we sustain a relationship where it doesn't exist? And then all these questions then lead off, shoot off into other sub-questions. So therein lies the fascinating, uh, almost labyrinthian uh, exploration of this relationship here, scenes from a marriage. And you have the television version that you have first, and then that's followed by the U.S. theatrical version. And what I love about that um, is that you've got, I, I love that, again, without going into too many details, but there are some, the, the, the stuff, the, the, the concepts are the same, and the storyline is essentially the same, but you do have certain presentation details that are different uh, as they are presented in the U.S. theatrical version. And for me, it always shows a slightly different way of looking at certain aspects of the film that I think uh, were probably a little bit more um, uh, diffused in the television version, or vice versa. And so this shows yet another angle to the relationship, I think. So to have the the television version up front, followed by the U.S. theatrical version, again gives us slightly different angles on the on certain aspects of this relationship, and it is a a marvelous juxtaposition, uh, I must say, which then leads into uh, the third film in the uh, curated order within the centerpiece one, which is of course Saraban, and now Saraban has a very direct link to scenes from a marriage. And so we have a sort of a continuation or development of the themes uh, and, the, and what's going on. And of course we have a separation of many years. So there is this idea of age. There is this idea of, of uh, different lives and a younger generation. Uh, but then at the same time, the old themes are still there. And what do I mean by that? We still have this idea of, again, war and peace, and the battleground is the human condition. Uh, this time, not just set within the context of marital relationship, but also within the context of romantic relationships, and also uh, quite key here, uh, set in the context of uh, the relationship between parents and children. So this is, I think, a, a marvelous, uh, of course, a continuation in terms of narrative, but it's also a great thematic uh, development that we see uh, starting from a scenes from uh, scenes from a marriage a television version and then progressing way, its way through the U.S. theatrical version and then now Saraband. Uh, where we have the extra added layer of uh, different kinds of relationship coming into the fore, but you still have this idea of, uh, of uh, some kind of violence and darkness uh, seeping into the conversation. And uh, this kind of emotional violence is, of course, very bitter and can be quite uh, uh, quite difficult to swallow. Uh, and that that's what I think is setting this 
this centerpiece one grouping off uh, from the earlier opening night grouping uh, in a fascinating way. So from that grouping, uh, the first entries in the centerpiece one group. Then we go into the film, which is um, the film from uh, uh, Bergman's uh, days in Germany. Uh, this is from the life of the marionettes. Now, here again, we have the continuation of this uh, idea begun with scenes from a marriage. That is an exploration of uh, a relationship between a husband and wife or a man and woman uh, in a romantic relationship. But in uh, this is also thematically uh, connected because uh, you know we do have um, characters that seem to be mirroring certain characters that we might have seen in uh, scenes from a marriage. But also we see this, the context of this relationship is a very dark one. And we see um, uh, emotional violence, but we also see physical violence, and we also see this kind of breakdown, um, and this idea of an exploration of, you know, what does it mean to be emotionally isolated <laughs> from your partner, and what does that emotional isolation uh, lead to in the context of the relationship? I mean, is that emotional isolation uh, in and of itself the goal or is it something that you wish to avoid but cannot because of some kind of crisis in the relationship to begin with? And so here we have uh, something very different. We have uh, not necessarily a couple uh, that in the scenes from marriage, I would say the couple was, uh, there There were signs of the possibility of some kind of a connection or reconciliation. In from the life of the marionette, from the life of the marionettes, we see a couple that, uh, well, the exploration of a couple in the context of the uh, the landscape of the human condition, wherein you have uh, perhaps little hope of any kind of emotional connection, and what does that mean for the uh, development of a relationship, if any development is indeed possible? And then if, uh, in that, you have uh, some very uh, uh, tough scenes of emotional violence and physical violence, too, quite shocking physical violence. So this is all intertwined in a way to lead to this discussion of, again, emotional violence, but this time uh, emotional violence that either leads to or is the result of some kind of emotional isolation within the context of uh, uh, this uh, husband-wife or a uh, lover-to-lover relationship. And that is a brilliant segue because after this film, we go into the film Hour of the Wolf. And if you want to talk about this idea of isolation uh, within uh, a couple dynamic, Hour of the Wolf is another wonderful examination of this. So this time we have, uh, again, uh, one side of the couple uh, essentially uh, 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 turning into himself. And so what does that mean in the context of this relationship? So we're not, we have uh, n not necessarily a, a couple that is uh, breaking apart, but I think a couple that is trying to stay together, but uh, it seems like one side of the couple is really turning into himself or, or becoming very inward and thus becoming very isolated. Now the reasons are unclear because we don't quite know what the background of this couple is and we don't quite know what the circumstances are as we see the film uh, open up. But we do know that there is some kind of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 well, again, we have a couple that is not uh, together, so to speak. Uh, they, they seem to be on different wavelengths, and the husband in particular is on a particularly different wavelength. And uh, it's so much so that uh, it becomes a very hallucinatory and almost uh, dreamlike or nightmarish landscape into uh, his own psyche. And uh, what are the uh, implications of that? Uh, and what are the implications of his turning inward uh, in the context of the relationship that he has or had with his wife? So that is Hour of the Wolf. And again, another example of, as I say, gen to be very general, uh, emotional violence in the context of uh, a couple. 
Then from there, we go into yet another very tumultuous relationship between uh, a couple in the film Shame. And this is one that's very interesting because now we are getting this, uh, again, uh, difficult relationship between uh, this couple. But I would say that it is compounded by the externalities or external forces that are beyond their control. So this idea of uh, this um, uh, basically unnamed war that is going on while the story is progressing and that how that leads into the plot and this idea of, of this thing that is outside or beyond the couple or outside of them the external forces how they seep in to the internal immediacy um, the internal intimacy of this couple and how that affects it um, or how the couple is able to withstand that or perhaps they're not able to withstand that and thus therein lies the 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 seeds for the destruction or perhaps the um, uh, perhaps that therein lies the uh, potential for the success of the the couple you know who who knows you know you have to watch the film to find out but uh, the uh, the notion here being that you have something that is very violent that's going on on the outside, on the periphery, and that seems to have some kind of effect on the inside, which is the context of relationship, which is in and of itself something that is very, uh, for lack of a better word, perhaps volatile. So again, another fascinating uh, permutation. Uh, another variation on the theme of uh, emotional violence within a couple. Uh, this time now adding the extra element of how externalities play a part. Then from shame we go into the passion of Anna. And the passion of Anna is very interesting indeed because, and I don't want to go into too much, but um, you have again these uh, these couples and this idea of of uh, um, the, the emotional violence that occurs between couples, it can be explained in a very simple way, which is lack of love, right? Lack of love. So what does it mean to a couple when there is a kind of a lack of love? So maybe you had couples that came together but gradually uh, started to fall apart because of this idea of lacking love or maybe love died or something. Maybe it was there to begin with, but it died. Well, Passion of Anna, I think, is very interesting because I think it takes that theme but twists it in a way. It, it, it asks the next question is, which is, all right, we've seen all these couples that seem to have come together, but now they are at, in some stage of perhaps uh, decomposition or breakup or risk thereof. Okay, But what if we go to the Passion of Anna? And what if we not, not just... Uh, see a, a relationship that is already existing in that state. But what, what if we have a, a story about a relationship that begins, but its very beginnings don't seem to involve love, right? You have a relationship that seems to begin, but it doesn't seem to be beginning based on love. And in fact, it seems to be beginning based on, not based on, but it seems to be uh, inaugurated despite the fact that there doesn't seem to be any love that exists from the outset. Now this is a very, very interesting permutation and another twist on the theme. And so to have this film fall within the uh, uh, curated order here is, is great. Now, of course, I understand that the films, um, Hour of the Wolf, Shame, and The Passion of Anna are considered to be a kind of a a loosely connected thematic trilogy uh, and uh, still still to have them here in this order and especially coming after uh, the uh, thematic discussion that occurred with uh, scenes from a marriage and Saraband and from the life of the marionettes I think you can see or at least I can see the the brilliant context uh, that Criterion is putting these films in you know this idea of uh, essentially the decomposition of of uh, relationships and the variations uh, on that particular theme as they exist through these uh, these films so the passion of anna uh, the, another great variation on the theme next we go from the passion of anna to for a document now this is an interesting jump uh, or is it right because as we progress through this first half of the uh, centerpiece one films, right, we started to get 
uh, introductions to the island life, the isolated island life. Now we started to see that, of course, in the film Hour of the Wolf. And then we saw that again in the film Shame. And it's shame is significant in that respect because now in Shame we get the, uh, the island of Fora. Uh, because, uh, as you may know, I, I think I, I'm right about this, right? Shame was sh uh, shot on the island of Fora, as was the film The Passion of Anna. So we have films that uh, introduce this idea of island location and the idea of isolation. Perhaps the isolation has a negative effect, I don't know, but we do see that environment taking shape. And then we see it crystallize through shame and the passion of Anna, and then we see it in full force in for the document so I think that's a lovely uh, uh, I, that's a lovely way to go into the for a document uh, documentary uh, you have Berman uh, basically interviewing people from this community and talk there you're hearing them talking about their lives and you're hearing them talking about their uh, concerns and their particular troubles it's not all rosy and sunny there are real world issues that confront these uh, particular uh, community inhabitants and they are worried about certain aspects uh, and uh, there are uh, there's the elder generation and the younger generation and uh, they have different concerns about their lives and about their futures, which is at once uh, very charming and also very, um, it, 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 it's, it can serve to be a quite concerning. So it serves to be a fascinating document. But all through it, you can tell that Bergman has a loving affection for this community. And you can see the idea of nature and isolation. Uh, but uh, we do also see a world that is not hermetically sealed. It is not a perfect idyllic world. It is a world that is filled also with the, um, the complex uh, themes of humanity that we have seen uh, in the exploration of the Bergman films up to date, that is uh, the idea of our future, the idea of how we take care of ourselves, the idea of older generations and younger generations, the idea of trying to find one's place in the world and hope and perhaps a lack of hope. So um, uh, this is a fascinating document uh, for, the, uh, for the document. And to have it here again is, uh, is great because it shows, I think, uh, you know, this idea of Fora, which uh, in my mind is a place I've never been, but it seems to be a very kind of romantic place because of its uh, idyllic uh, scenery. But in reality, there are issues that are quite concerning and um, uh, perhaps quite pressing in some ways because they have to deal with uh, certain uh, 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 economic or, or uh, uh, societal issues. Uh, so again, we have this idea of the idyllic and uh, uh, things are not always so sunny. So perhaps this could be seen as a kind of a, uh, um, a tangential connection with the films that we've seen before. You know, this idea of marriage is supposed to be idyllic, but it's not always. In fact, it can be, it can be, it can be quite violent sometimes, and very negative. Where here we have the same thing. Well, Fora is a very idyllic location and a beautiful place, but there are issues bubbling beneath that um, uh, are quite pressing and concerning to the inhabitants and residents there. And then this continues to the film The Fora Document 1979, which is a wonderful continuation of the Fora Document because we see, uh, well, in essence, we see Bergman pick up uh, with uh, some of the inhabitants that were, that were interviewed earlier. We also see developments of, um, of, of certain uh, aspects of Fora uh, society and Fora life that we saw glimpses or hints at in the earlier document. And so again, this is another uh, progression. And uh, this is nice too, because uh, not only do we get the uh, continuation of the themes of Florida document, but also we get that added element of life and growth and thing growing and uh, time moving and life being a part of that movement of time. You know, we see people, kids grow up 
from Fora document to there being adults being interviewed again in the later documentary. So you have the sense of a community growing and you have the sense of people growing and, 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 and uh, 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 having different perspectives based on the uh, lives that they have led uh, in between, in the interim. And this is, an, again, another part of Bergman's uh, filmography, is not because this is another thing about uh, a slice of life and uh, this idea of growth over time and how that changes us and how the environment can change us. And haven't we seen this already before in the context of relationships? Relationships start one way and they end another way. Well, again, it's... Uh, we have real human beings here going through the same things. You know, they start in one place and then they grow and then they end up in a completely different place. To see that juxtaposition is utterly compelling. Then from Fora document and Fora document 1979, we get to another uh, Fora uh, related film. But the Fora connection then provides yet another uh, uh, sort of chapter within the context of Centerpiece One. So now this is Through a Glass Darkly. Now Through a Glass Darkly is very significant because now we have the introduction of, or not the introduction, but we have the focus now being on on uh, mental illness and also we have this idea of um, mental illness and uh uh, family relationships, the family dynamic of father and children and also sibling relationship which is very significant in this film. And also we have thrown in that this idea of the existence of God and what that means in the context of human relationships. So how does God manifest uh, if at all? And this idea of well this is it can it really be said that God equals love? Or is God really something other than love? Is God something more sinister, perhaps in the shape of a spider or something? So this is something that is very uh, significant and uh, a significant move. And again, we have a connection with Fora, but uh, from this we, this, we get this idea of a um, uh, return to um, the uh, well first of all you do get a return to the uh, parent children relationships and also the relationships between um, uh, uh, well we get parent children relationships but also we get the focus between the uh, you know the relationship between siblings and also we get now a discussion of the idea of uh, yes not just something external uh, but also this idea of God now, from there, we go to the film Winter Light. Now, Winter Light is a very significant film in this context because we have this idea of, you know, a, a crisis of faith or this idea of, you know, uh, what happens when one loses one's belief and how does one lose one's belief and how that loss of belief affects one's relationships with the people around one. So this is all very uh, significant. And this is something that uh, is, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's perfect because it brings together this idea of, uh, you know, the idea of uh, uh, the existence of some kind of a deity or God and the idea of how that consideration or the philosophical uh, crises that occur, uh, how that affects human relationships. And here we get this uh, exploration uh, done oh so uh, deftly uh, in Winter Light. And then from Winter Light, of course, we go to the film uh, The Silence. And then The Silence is, uh, I would say, a continuation of this idea of uh, we have uh, um, uh, this idea of uh, what, um, a sibling relationship and also uh, maybe we're not getting necessarily uh, a f direct focus on the, the discussion of does God exist or not but we are getting uh, now the discussion of you know what happens when you have uh, a, a, a lack of a belief system and how that seems to affect 
uh, relationship. So this can be seen, I think, in that respect as a continuation of the themes that we've seen in Winter Light. But now we're, we're focusing uh, purely on um, you know, this relationship between these two women and also the context uh, here. We have uh, emotional need and we also have the idea of sickness and uh, dependency based on sickness. Uh, but also uh, the idea of how that dependency, you know, is that uh, something that is legitimate and something that leads to a, a full uh, blossoming and um, a natural relationship, or does it lead to something that is completely the opposite of that? And uh, depending on what the situation is, how does that square? And also in, thrown in the mix, of course, is this wonderful element with the, with the child, and you have this idea here, again, generally speaking, of how the how one can uh, accurately and uh, affectionately uh, convey one's feelings to another. I mean, that's the ultimate uh, existential uh, dilemma, is it not? You know, how we can uh, show ourselves to someone else who is completely outside of our own perceptions of who we are. So this is uh, a wonderful continuation of the uh, Centerpiece One films because you know we have this um, uh, we have this at the start we have this marital relationship that then progresses all the way through to familial relationships and the relationships among family in Through a Glass Darkly, and then we also have this relationship. Uh, you know, um, it's. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, with this, with the pastor in the uh, in Winterlight, but how the how his personal feelings about God seem to affect his uh, relationships with other people. But then we then return to this idea of of um, a kind of a, a familial relationship, but it seems to be one that is uh, again uh, set within the context of a lack of a belief system. So we have a wonderful through line um, uh, that seems to be interconnected within these three films. And so it's often the case that these three films are grouped in um, a so-called trilogy. Uh, now, whether that is uh, a, a, an accurate depiction of these uh, or description of these three films is, I think, something that is still up for debate. So uh, Criterion has released the films in a trilogy form, but I think it I don't know. I still think it's it's still uh, there's room for debate on that particular point. But uh, be that as it may, I think the fact that they appear in this order is significant in the centerpiece one. But also the fact that they occur in within the centerpiece one is very significant because they seem to be a continuation of this uh, emotional violence that can occur uh, between people or among people. And then when we're talking about emotional violence and physical violence, of course, we go from there to the Virgin Spring. And this ends Centerpiece 1. And this seems, therefore, to mean that Centerpiece 1 is a very bleak, <laughs> a very bleak grouping of films because the Virgin Spring is, uh, we, we do have something here about this idea of, uh, of uh, youthful hope and this idea of youthful hope in the context of a cruel, cruel world. And this idea of, uh, you know, th the idea of faith comes in, uh, the idea of, you know, why does, if God exists, why does God allow uh, bad things to happen to good people? And also this idea of, uh, you know, how does, um, how the relationships uh, between family or among family members, and how that, how those relationships are affected when there is a certain uh, crisis or when there is certain trauma that occurs, uh, and what happens to one's um, uh, bearings uh, when that happens, and you know, does that mean that? Uh, I mean, if certain events happen, uh, do we still manage to maintain our humanity, or do we manage to uh, be better than ourselves, or perhaps the opposite? Do we succumb to our uh, our, our sort of uh, um, our our basest desires and turn into something that is lesser than ourselves? So this is all a, a very bleak exploration. And this is a, a, 
I think, a thematically appropriate through line uh, capped off marvelously by the Criterion Collection. And then we get the 13th century kind of medieval uh, Swedish setting, and uh, we also get uh, this notion of of um, uh, uh, of, of a kind of uh, you know uh, a kind of a, a family dynamic, but again we have externalities that are at play. So again, this idea of the external versus the internal, and which side will win. So with that in mind, my friends, this has been centerpiece one. So we have a lot a lot going on here and perhaps too much to <laughs> to discuss within the context of a single video but this is this all again very general discussion of these films and i think you hopefully you've uh, been able to get a sense of uh, just the real richness and uh, um, challenging complexity that is at play here in the centerpiece one it is a dark world indeed um, in, uh, in in Bergman's world, in this in Bergman's centerpiece one world, so uh, there is a lot of uh, nastiness. There is a lot of unpleasantness. There is room for optimism, I, I admit, but perhaps um, that is not the focus here. And so uh, this is yet another facet of uh, Bergman's exploration of the human condition and the human psyche. So that is centerpiece one. So I will be uh, turning off now, and uh, next time I would like to, if I may, talk to you about Centerpiece 2. Until then, my friends, cheers.